All right, good afternoon. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, roughly 50 minutes time for discussion. I have been asked to, to introduce this discussion by a few words. Uh, I'd like to start with asking a question about uh, our attitudes. I'm 62 now and I'm, I'm starting to think who is going to take care of me when I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to stay at home. I want to stay at home and expect that somebody, somebody has responsibility to provide me assistance. And uh, quality of service must be measured. How many of you are thinking that uh, the critical factor is how much time uh, that person who is my caregiver will have for me at home. Is that a good method to, to measure, measure quality? Is there anyone who is accepting that aspect, that more time, better care? <laughs> who, is, uh, who is having the opposite opinion? Less care is good care. <laughs> <laughs> no one. You all are, are wrong. Because actually, there is evidence that less care is good care. In the Netherlands, they had uh, uh, a system, so-called so -called neighborhood nursing system, until late 80s. And then they decided to do what we are also doing, to create larger and bigger institutions to take care of that, and to create hierarchical system so that all kind of specialized systems will be available. At the, at the end of the day, in the beginning of uh, 2000s, everyone was unhappy. Caregivers had the feeling that we don't have time and capacity to do what is required, and uh, clients were saying, we don't need, we don't get what we want. We all were unhappy. And then a company, a non-profit company called Burts Org, was created. How many of you have heard about it? Luckily, few of you. But in this sort of country, only few people know that there is a company called Burts Org. After three years, Burts Org was analyzed by uh, Ernst and Young. What are the results? And there were three fundamental consequences. For the first, the quality of services was much, much higher than any other competitor. Both clients and caregivers were extremely happy what they have experienced. Secondly, this system created less, much less challenges for the special, care, special healthcare system than others. So people were able to survive without having special care uh, healthcare services in many cases. So less costs for, for the healthcare system. But at the end of the day, they recognize third important conclusion they spent 40% less time per client than any other competitor. And now they have 70% of the market in the Netherlands, they are in the United States, they are in Sweden, but not in Finland because we know exactly how to do these things. <laughs> I, this is my, my introductory, part of my introductory speech, because I think when we are speaking about the future, we have to understand that we don't have only business model challenges, not only governmental structure challenges, but we have also a lot of legacies. Mm. We believe that we know how things are and we don't understand that the world is changing in a, in a dramatic, dramatic way. And technology is more or less the key, and it is the key driver of, of, of that change. Americans are discussing, is, is it big government or small government? I think that is not a relevant issue. The relevant question is, is the government smart or not? And there are two paradoxes when looking at business and government collaboration. First paradox is that <coughs> I have been both in politics and government, and I, I know what we are thinking on both sides, separately. Uh, on, in politics, or let's start from business. In business, if you ask business leaders, sometimes I have the feeling that they know much better how to run a government than to run their own <laughs> business. And in the other way, too. Mm. So, 
If you ask politicians, they are very concerned what to do, how to reform uh, systems, uh, what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, models have to be used, but they know exactly how good business should be done. And they are ready to provide assistance, read newspapers or look at the TV discussions. They, are, they know how business should be done. But, uh, but that is one product. Another one is that Andy Hald Haldane, if I remember correct, he is, uh, he is uh, chief economist of uh, the Bank of England, and he is innovation expert. Both the President Ahtisaari and, uh, and also Alahuta, both of you mentioned several times the word innovation. We like that. It's a solution for everything. But Haldane analyzed what is required for innovation, and a lot of things which have been discussed, education, uh, financial resources, uh, technological assets, and so on. But the last point on his list, patience. You need patience. Do we have patience? In politics, uh, the present president of the EU Commission, Juncker, said once, we know exactly what to do and how to do, but we don't know how to be re-elected after executing that. And that is a pro problem in politics. I know it. It's so easy to, to say what to do, but it's very difficult to communicate that to the audience in a way that you will get support for that. If you want to ask advice, I can do that. Secondly, in business, every quarter, your shareholders are asking, how is the result? Is it improving? If not, you will be kicked out. And at least after annual res result, you are, you are really challenged if you are not able to meet the challenges of, of, of uh, uh, shareholders. So maybe Emil Hurja, who invented 1936 the idea, he was, by the way, a Finn, but he invented the idea to use poles in politics. He made catastrophic invention or innovation. And in the same way, Friedman made fantastic idea, but quite critical idea when he started to say that companies do have only shareholders' value and nothing else. So we, these are the approaches. And, and we have excellent panelists, they were already introduced, I don't have to do that again. Uh, I, I'd like to go directly to, to the discussion. I'd like to start from, from, from what President Artisar said. You said that, that uh, business has capacities, talents and skills, which can help us to solve these global problems. Environmental problems, uh, security problems, development problems. But my question to you is, has business community been able to communicate that to the audience? Do you think that business has been able to, to do that, what President Artis has said, to say that we are not part of the problem, but we are part of the solution? Inka, maybe you will start. Well, I'm trying to take a global look on, on, on this question, and I do think that there is a clear pol polarization among companies and businesses in, in So you are like a politician, that there are good, good <coughs> guys and bad guys? Yeah, or I would say that there are active guys and passive guys. So if you think about like things that really matter, like uh, in, in, a, in a kind of a longer term scale and, and the mega trends that we're going through, obviously from the business point of view, we're very often looking into the technological disruption and consumer value changes and obviously environmental things because we're kind of a bit forced by the consumers as well. But in, in reality, then things like world hunger, uh, the, the global education thing, uh, environmental topics, there are companies that have really taken a stand. And obviously, if you look like these hyper-innovative disruptor companies coming, for example, from the <coughs> US, they might have a really strong economical or, sorry, ecological say in, in their core values and their core mission. Uh, let's think about Hyperloop, for example, which we kind of think as a ziggy zaggy kind of a wonder thing still, you know, developed by Elon Musk uh, with an opportunity possibly even, for example, to connect cities with a 12 to 20 minutes uh, time frame from here to Stockholm. Um, 
what can that deliver to the society? Well, it can completely change the way we can work and where we can work. And at the same time, if we look at like traditional manufacturing companies in the energy industry, for example, there are only the few ones which have taken the green energy approach and then the ones that who have taken the innovative, let's renew ourselves. So I would kind of a summarize my thinking here is that, yes, there are very different kinds of a companies and it really drives from that culture that company has. What is the mission of that specific company? We know tobacco companies that have become sports companies. So tapping to a really global sporty megatrend. So in that respect, I think there's a big chance. So how to communicate this? Um, firstly, you have to be honest and true about that imperative or mission. So you can't fake that. Uh, from 4 to 10, mm. uh, my question was how well they have been, business community as mm. a whole has been able to communicate. As a whole, that. I would give a 6. 6. Okay, Pekka. You have been in business, but you, have, you are now, nowadays working quite close to the government as well. I, I don't have the same breadth of experience as you, Esko, but you said that the politicians know better business and business people better the governmental side, so we need more rotation. And seriously, I, I, I think that, is, that would be very important, that people would actually appreciate the, the challenges, the complexities and the different natures of solving and getting things done. If you are a politician or if you are a civil servant, you should really respect that world. It's a tough world and there's a own logic there and it's, it's a very understandable logic and there are people who are trying their best to change things for the better. But you need to understand the logic and, 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 and you don't have the same opportunities, yet you have also probably certain things which are easier to do there than in business, where business laws and the short termism actually uh, has a big say on, on, on decisions. I would uh, Pico, may I ask you, why, why is it so difficult now? In 1920s, even 1930s, it was very typical that the academic people went to politics. Business leaders were sometimes in politics, sometimes in business. But in Finland, if you want to break that, that line. I know it. You take a huge risk. You take a, you take a major risk at the personal both, on level. Both sides? Yes. Or you all do. sides? I, I don't have the answer. But I, I would say that the um, good examples, discussions, and then there are matters we may be come back to the topics of public-private partnership yeah, we will. as a means for societies to find innovative social new ways of reinventing itself in a good cooperation with all the necessary stakeholders to make big changes to happen. And these public-private partnership contexts probably would give a better insight for many people to actually understand and appreciate the challenges and also probably the opportunities to have a rotation. Having said that, I must say that I'm very in encouraged to see many young people carrying the Finnish flag and coming to work to government, particularly on the digitalization side. There are fantastic people there who have said, I come, I see a big mission here, I can help in digitalizing Finland. And I can give a list of number of people who are doing that. So therefore, it is not necessarily that grim. And Pekka, from four to ten. It depends, uh, because I think you need to separate the impact of big companies, mm. smart uh, no, startup no, companies, no, and also the, the, the medium-sized companies. I would take one name up, who is a great example of responsible leader at the global level, and that's Unilever's Paul Polman. If you want to see a person who really takes it personally, carries the torch and has actually uh, created a major network, because networking is here one yeah. issue as well. And, and he has alone made a major impact. Startups have done a lot. My, I would give a... It's a, it's a two, I would say six and a half. Yeah. And, and, and trending Trend up, up, which is Trend important. Is up, yeah, <laughs> good. Another pick up. Well, actually, in a way, I'm relatively optimistic, but the problem is that when things have turned into problems, 
oftentimes actually the business in a way faces great criticism when they are trying to enter that marketplace and solve them. For example, when the CEO of Nestle suggested that the problem why we are polluting um, uh, the water supplies is that no one owns them, that, that there should be a clear owner. And um, that was a terrible, um, uh, terrible uh, welcoming in the media and, and no one quite liked the idea. Actually, business is better solving problems before they become problems. For example, um, cities growing, there would be new bottlenecks, but with the sharing economy, well, I know that these are old examples, Airbnb, Uber, are actually solving problems by anticipating them. No one thanks the business, people see it only as a business, but in a way, if something hadn't been done, they would turn into, into real, real issues. And, but in small scale, I think very, actually it has been very successful for a very, very long period of time, even in Finland, which is oftentimes seen as a microcosmos of everything being very uh, siloed and rigid. It's actually urban planning. Uh, in Tampere, they have great examples of turning old factories into to very, very vibrant hubs for a business. In Helsinki, if you go to um, Hernessar, which was pretty much quiet and, and declining neighborhood, now it's very vivid. And there is where we see lots of great collaboration between businesses and civil servants, mutual trust and, and, and very successful outcomes. Mm -hmm. And your... your uh, um, let's say, ranking. I'm a marketing professor, so I'll give it 8+. plus. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, um, um, uh, Minna Halme, you are more or less specialist in this, so your, your, uh, your academic area is, is sustainability and corporate social responsibility. How is your analysis? Is, is, do you agree that the situation is improving and, uh, and how do you see the, the future challenges? I think that the situation is improving, but at the same time it's not improving. And what I mean by this is that we see an increasing number of sustainability innovations coming from a number of business companies, large and small. So, um, you know, solving global problems like climate change or shortage of natural resources or uh, global poverty related problems. We see increasing number of business models in those areas. But at the same time, what I'm also seeing is that uh, much of the mainstream business is actually not fundamentally changing. We do have the Unilever examples, but we also have a number of corporations who are not undergoing such a profound change. But we actually have this um, paradigm of short-terminism and what is sometimes called the bonus culture, which means that uh, business managers are almost made to play in the way that uh, they increase the dividends in the short term, they increase their own bonuses and profits in the short term and can lose the sight of um, the long term. So I'm seeing that, uh, that there are these uh, two trends that are existing at the same time. And uh, I hope uh, that the sustainable innovations trend will win the day. But what I think that it needs to happen is actually smart regulation and policy instruments. So I don't think that business is the only agent that by itself alone can be carrying the torch mm. of responsible activities. We, we have a lot of um, research on the, on the area of what kind of societies breed responsible uh, business activities. And it is indeed uh, smart <laughs> regulation, smart policy instruments mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that lead to that direction. And your score would be? for the improving versus how, how well are we improving? Mm, I'd say for me it's like we are improving nine, but at the same time <laughs> we are going down. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this, is, this is typical academic answer. Yes, so <laughs> I'm coming on to the, the on answer. On one hand, on the other <laughs> hand. Yeah. So nine uh, minus, let's say, um, two. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd give a seven. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I was asking this because I, I think we have a, a typical legacy in Finland is that, that 
if you ask people, and especially politicians, how to provide good, for example, healthcare services, uh, I cannot translate this, and this is impossible to be translated into, into English, but, but people, are, people are having the feeling that, that, uh, that or, or politicians are saying that, or not saying that meillä on oikeus kunnallisiin palveluihin, vaan ne sanovat, että meillä pitää olla oikeus kunnallisiin palveluihin. <laughs> this is impossible to, to be translated, but, but it, it means that, that we believe that who is providing these services is ideological issue, and it's not that relevant if that works well or not. But Pekka, you had uh, a comment on this. I had a comment. I think that the smart regulation is absolutely one of those enablers where, where the public side uh, should provide a predictable framework. Yeah. And that predictability is extremely important. We have seen on the energy side what the unpredictability can do. It can completely ruin the market or, or, or ruin the possibility for industry to, to renew itself. But the predictability is important. And another thing where I think that actually things are changing for the better is the transparency. The mm -hmm. social media, the way how things are really spreading around. If you don't behave well, that is, there are mm. by effects and byproducts which are negative. But this transparency is crucial. And the power of consumer, power of customer is growing and growing. And I think that that, is a, that works concurrently to the direction where the company's interest and profit-making is actually dependent on how well they behave. Mm -hmm. And I think... Yeah. Uh, another short comment, and then we have to move to the next topic in order to cover yep. some other areas as well. Uh, I believe that there is an upside in, in having this kind of clever regulation in place. But at the same time, I believe that most of the marketplaces are becoming more and more competitive. So actually one source of competitive edge is to have your company values and priorities aligned with the values and priorities of your target audience. Uh, we saw Body Shop 35 years ago finding its place in the marketplace by selling products, not by advertising, not by uh, running price promotions, but by actually finding its own niche market and becoming very successful by become being more sustainable than others and becoming a role model. And actually there are tens of more examples of this. So, so I believe that regulation is the only, not the only driver. The competition drives this as well. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, let's leave this topic. I, I think we had very, very good start for this discussion. But let's move to the next question, which is, I think, extremely critical. Uh, uh, do you agree that uh, we are moving to the digital age and that is the key driver for business and government collaboration as well? Are you, do you agree that? Yes. If you will take this as given, as given that this is a fact, uh, do you feel that business and government collaboration as it is, is able to meet that challenge? And, uh, Inka, you have, uh, you have experience from, let's say, startup and growth company perspective. Do you, feel, do you have a feeling that the government of Finland, for example, is able to understand what's going on and really able to understand that totally new type of business is, is, is going to grow in Finland? In, in many areas, yes. I, I think we've seen very active role of the government in via uh, Tekes, for example funding the R&D investments and understanding the value of, uh, let's say, innovative ecosystem, given the example of the deregulation of the telecom industry in the 90s, which really fueled the Finnish electronics industry, mm -hmm. exports and labor con kind of a employment and, and innovations. At the same time, I think we're facing a challenge where our decision makers kind of a take a legacy thinking, as you a bit pointed out. So often in the startup ecosystem, I would say that the role of government are easily considered as an investor, where I, I, I do think that we should strongly consider the role of government or the society as an enabler. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, if we think about functioning business ecosystem, we need big companies which are innovative, which collaborate with the medium and innovative sized uh, startups. Uh, we need to often fuel the investments to the kind of innovations and for the risk 
measurement point of view, obviously we have very limited amount of angel investors still in Scandinavia, for example. Often the consideration is that the government should kind of invest in that area. Well, there is another way of thinking. We, should, we could also think that maybe government could enable the private many money to flow to that industry. Mm -hmm. So there are different ways. Do you create an organization, an institution that manages the tax-funded investments, or do you create a platform that fuels that? Same applies to the growth of ecosystems. Uh, for example, how do we create the skill sets that are able to drive uh, innovative ecosystem? And I emphasize here that it's not just startups. Startups are kind of a phenomena of the forest moving uh, disruption, which is really happening now. Uh, the same disruption is happening and should be happening in the big corporations as well. But it's a great and efficient way to, to grow talent. But so the skill sets, uh, the money flows, the ecosystems, and I'll give you a final example because I'm sure that other panelists have something to say about this as well. Um, a great example of, of then a platform thinking is, is what we saw yesterday at the old hospital of Maria, which nowadays is a startup hub, which is a great example of a public-private co-op. We created via Startup Sauna Foundation a organization with the Helsinki city, which is now operating this startup hub for basically investors, angels, but mostly importantly for entrepreneurs just in the corner of, 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 of the university here. So I was in the opening party, more than 2,000 people there, and you kind of saw that this is exactly what Helsinki needed. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, there, are, there are a lot of perspectives here, and, and I would say that in order for the decision makers to kind of fuel the right things, obviously you need to understand that you know, eventually Uber-driven business models will be here. So are we hindering them or are we enabling them? Mm -hmm. um, and that, there I would kind of take a look to the south, not to Greece or Italy, but maybe to Estonia, which has been quite innovative in terms of a, its, uh, let's say, enablement of, of startups and growth companies. Pekka, you have been involved uh, in these kind of uh, efforts uh, since 2009, 10. Yeah. Well, well. Uh -huh. time is not running as fast as, as I expected. <laughs> so what is your experience? Do you feel that uh, if you have to-do list and not to-do list, is to-do list longer than not to-do list? I would, if you would have asked what is the number now from scale 4 <laughs> to 10, I would have More given nine, and 9 plus. And that's, due and, why? The, and that's due to the fact that, uh, to start with, I think that there is an understanding. And now I may first cover briefly the public side and then to the private side. On the public side, there is a very deep understanding of the importance of digitalization. I haven't met a single person who, who would deny that or would be against. And secondly, there is willingness. People are actively seeking ways how they could actually digitalize the processes. And here are processes which are customer driven. A customer is a citizen, enterprise or government itself. So we, are, we have made a major, major uh, advancements there. The difficult part is in, in front of us, which is these systemic changes which go across the different governmental sectors, which is not easy. But anyway, starting point is good. Secondly, we have a unique position when it comes to the enablers, because public side should build the enablers, private side should take the business risks, but then it's this public-private partnership where they, they should come together to create winning and growing ecosystems, which are the foundations for the growth, and where the innovation can then be applied in in different uh, different way and here building this infrastructure finland is the number one the only only country in the world where we have a, a national infrastructure for information uh, channels it's called x road uh, we, estonia did it first but they did it from the Clean scratch. sheet of paper from scratch. But we are the first country in the world who has changed its infrastructure on the go. And it's now functioning. The 1st uh, of July this year, there's a law which is saying, law in force, 
saying no service can be built on the public side in Finland if it's not compatible with X road. And, that, and there are many, many other things which I could go on saying that we have built the enablers in place. But now comes the next stage. When they are in place, we need to then digitalize governmental processes on, based on customer approach, being customer driven. And then we need to create those ecosystems where the growth can then take off. Mm -hmm. And we have good seeds. We have mobility as a service, Liikennekaari. We have a digital uh, healthcare, SOTE. We have education. We have uh, data. We have a special position in the world with our data uh, resources. And again, Three weeks ago, a law was, or the proposed law was post put on a circulation where the secondary use of that data would be a, a major way of guaranteeing that we could have um, major availability of that data to be used, but so that Finland would benefit. So, major enabler, uh, not only for Finnish companies, but companies from outside to come to Finland actually built ecosystems. So, 9 plus. Pekka, what you are saying is that, uh, in your opinion, the Finnish government and uh, policymakers and even companies who are in involved in this do have that patience required? They have the patience. Uh, the impatience, impatience is needed in finding the ways how the next stage is built. And that is the public-private partnership where the ecosystems, the small companies, bigger companies, universities, researchers and the public agencies are coming together and finding the ways, which is very difficult. What is the social innovation to create these positive virtual circles? So, but there is a lot of work, for example, uh, TEM, the Elinkeino Ministerio, is, is working very hard on that. Pekka Mattila, you, you have seen a lot of uh, management team members, even CEOs, to be educated. Do you feel that uh, they have uh, interest to not only to create capacities to lead companies, but capacities to integrate their businesses with uh, broader societal or governmental, uh, governmental uh, initiatives? Some of them do, some of them don't, and I think it's not a generational thing only. I think it comes, it, it, it has something to do with the mindsets. Uh, oftentimes, actually, I, I think there is lots of animosity between business people and civil servants because they don't know really each other. They don't know each other's agendas. So actually, yeah. civil servants are risk averse. They don't quite trust the business. The business people treat civil servants as as obstacles. So in a way. If there would be more um, going back and forth between uh, public sector, private sector, most probably the attitudes would change faster. But the most strategic CEOs and C-level executives, they understand that actually uh, working together, uh, trying to, to create this kind of stable regulatory environment and actually partnering with the public sector is actually a great way to change the marketplace change the market behavior and change the market structures, but it takes long-term thinking and you need to have a 10, 15 year sight. And the problem is that C-level executives normally spend less than four years in their current positions. So there are no incentives to have very long-term view, unfortunately. Uh, if, if you are looking at uh, companies from corporate social responsibility perspective, and let's think about a company I don't want to mention any name, but I have experience from Nokia. So, so uh, when they are doing talent review, any, any management team makes talent review. Do you think that this uh, corporate social responsibility aspects or broader societal understanding or capacity to work with, uh, with government is uh, recognized in those talent reviews? Or is it only talent review, looking at how, how you have specialized in what you are doing, how you are working with your team, what kind of results you have been able to achieve. So is this broader perspective well enough 
taken into the consideration in, in daily business? I'm afraid not. Um, I think it's much more um, the latter that you are uh, mentioning. Um, the idea that you should know, you know, the silo that you would, will be working with and, and you should be a good team leader and, and such and such. I think that there is relatively little uh, talent measuring still as of today of uh, a person's understanding of the world, of how the society functions, how our company influences the society, and so on and so forth. It may be there uh, in the rhetorics, and it may be even in the minds of the top management, but coming down to uh, talent measuring, I, I, I think that it is difficult, and I don't think that it is systematically being done. Obviously, uh, when CSR professionals or sustainability professionals are employed, that is when that kind of questions um, come into play. But, um, but I was just uh, actually saying in our uh, earlier lunch discussion that I think that the complex problems of the world would really require that we here in the business school would uh, teach in such a way that people not only become narrow experts mm -hmm. of their field, mm -hmm. but they have more broad understanding of society and how society functions, but also that companies would measure that and, and would appreciate that amongst their uh, managers and, and, and leaders. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to comment here because obviously I have a privilege to work with three public companies and, and I have to say that in, in that respect what you asked is that it's a quite of a burning question in a sense that I th think at the same time the bigger companies are looking at the challenge of finding the digital talents, but multidisciplinary talents, the entrepreneurial talents, and also new kind of a leadership talents as the kind of a ways of leading the business is really changing. And in some businesses, for example, in the construction industry, the way to work with the government and the environment and the cities and other players is extremely vital. Yeah. So it's yeah. well recognized. But then if you look like more consumer goods industry, I think the focus is in a different kind of a talent. So it varies across yeah. industries. So my, my idea is that why I'm asking this is that I, I don't believe that we are able to take benefit from digital technologies if we are not able to create create capacity to integrate different mm. skills and mm. talents mm. Uh, in a new way. And uh, actually you were preaching us to the last question because we have only 15 minutes left. Uh, the question how these skills, talents and capacities can be created. Is, uh, is it enough that we have good universities, good schools who are training people for this or do we have to do something faster? And, and what is the right method to do that? Pekka, you actually already raised this issue. What is your opinion? What, what should uh, Aalto University to do? What should uh, leadership of the company to do in order to, to create these multidisciplinary talents or multicultural talents uh, mentioned in the, in, the, in the keynote of, uh, of uh, Tina Alahuhta? It, it boils down to the to leadership, somebody needs to lead. And then the leader, and the way how the leader shows the example will radiate. And the leader is also setting the objectives. And I think that um, the talent part and the talent review is important, but probably something which precedes that one is the target setting. Well, how the objectives, the value-based objectives, which are softer ones, and, and how then the hard financial targets are set. And the, the, the softer ones are passed, they are part of the culture and the value of the company. And they're the example how the company is led, and Paul Polman using just one person's example, which is not necessarily the right way, but demonstrating what one man can do in a very big and very rigid and conservative industry and conservative company in a very short period of time. So his behavior, his target setting new values have really changed Unilever in, 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 a, in a tremendous way. So therefore, it boils down to the responsibility, but the legislation or smart regulation helps in setting the targets, also so that they are financially rewarding. So, um, as any 
change. It starts from the people who are running it. And then we should actually be quite courageous changing people in their positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mina, uh, the first. I would, yes, I, I would emphasize here um, understanding co-creation and collaboration and the skills of those. It's so easily said but it's so difficult to do. It's, it's much more easy to communicate with people whose worldview and knowledge background are the same as, as, as your own. Uh, if I mention what we are doing here at Aalto is, for instance, the uh, cross-disciplinary master programs of creative sustainability and international design business management, where we bring together students from technology, from design, and, and from our own uh, business school, and, and they learn to work together in uh, their classes in, and in their student projects already when they are students. And by those learnings actually come respect toward the others and, and also come the knowledge of the understanding of the languages of the uh, other professions. And I think that those kind of skills are then also what companies increasingly need. And of course, you will learn this also later on in your life, in the hard way, if you are of a learning kind. But I think that in our current world situation, we should really increasingly understand that it's not one company, one profession, or it's not the private sector, or it's not the public organization acts that can solve problems, but it's, it's really collective wisdoms that we should be developing. And, and, and this is, you know, sort of uh, giving up of your feeling of, I know how this mm -hmm. should be done. Yeah. And, and rather thinking that it's, it's us together who, who need to bring in our, uh, our knowledge and, and, and our experience. And I see some so wonderful uh, results already at the level of, uh, student uh, projects that uh, lead to startups and lead to collaborations of startups with larger companies or design for uh, government projects that I'm, I'm just sometimes really amazed myself by how much uh, with such a basically simple thing, co-creation, developing collaborative wisdoms, uh, we could reach. And I wish that we would see some of that same at the moment in in, in our society, solving the, uh, the very complex problems that, for instance, Finland is facing at the moment. Pekka, is there a risk that uh, the final outcome will be like in our Olympic team, so that we have <laughs> good culture but uh, no results? Uh, well, d definitely yes. Um, oftentimes, when you want to create a winning culture, a winning, winning uh, context, you need to have two things in place social support, which is the, all the feel-good parts that the Olympian team definitely had. And then you need to have performance management system. Yeah. So if you only have the performance management, it's a burnout context in a way. It's no one wants to stay there for a long period of time. If you only have the social support, it's a country club. Someone is playing piano, but no results are being achieved. So you need both. It's a paradox in a way. There is tension. But just going back to what was said before quickly, I think we are a bit conservative and narrow if we think that the only way to build this kind of diverse talent pool is to hire and fire in a way. Mm. I, I, I think the big companies are becoming more and more open about collaborating and partnering. They con consider the world in terms of ecosystems in a way that, that it's an extended organization. They have partners for s certain purposes and I think it's happening more and more. But it takes higher levels of transparency. And it's, it's a difficult thing because many companies used to be like fortresses, very closed, mm. not revealing anything of themselves. But you need to give if you want to take. And I think this is a learning point. That to a certain extent, public sector, that should have it easier in a way, because they have no secrets in a way, like it's, it's, it's for everybody. They are actually even more conservative. Mm. They have it more difficult to actually partner mm. when solving problems. So I think private sector is is a front runner, and just very quickly, I think actually the current university education supports this kind of development of diverse talent. For example, we have this bachelor degree and the master's degree, and it's quite natural that you take two different majors, two different schools. It di didn't happen when I was studying. You had just mm -hmm. narrow pipe, 
and after five years you graduated, hopefully, if you were meeting the deadline. Mm -hmm. Now it's easier to change and build this kind of portfolio, but it's up to you. And actually, sometimes we make these boxes for ourselves. It was uh, two weeks ago, I was mentoring one, one of my marketing students who thought that she could never apply for a McKinsey because she's for, from marketing. So L'Oreal is the only option for her. And actually, what McKinsey is at the moment looking for is, is actually people from different backgrounds, not only from mm -hmm. finance. So yeah. it's a box we make ourselves. Inka, uh, are you worried that this... We have now mm. huge startup community in mm. Finland. Really, really exciting phenomenon. Exceptional in a way as well that academic people are excited to start mm. their own businesses. Are you, are you afraid that these young people are looking only narrowly their own business opportunity, not thinking about the society around them? No, I think on the contrary, they are absolutely considering and looking to the society around them much more than typically, let's say, middle-aged managers in bigger corporations. I would state that strongly. And, and, and the reason why I'm saying that, as, as you kind of a, were asking about the skill sets and, and talent that we need to build, is that, firstly, I think people who have taken an entrepreneurial track, a career path, they understand that it's a lifelong uh, learning curve that you need to build. So it's not about academic studies only, or conducting your certain degree, but you need to learn throughout the way. For example, I've taken a personal challenge to learn all the machine learning companies in this region during the next six months, because I need to understand that phen phenomena. Second thing is that it's about leadership and kind of a, uh, as, as has been discussed here, it's about kind of a making things to happen together. You have such a scare resource, so you need to motivate people to work for you for free and get bigger companies to buy your product, which is not ready, and of course influence the society around you to get your product out there to the market. Um, and thirdly, I would say it's, it's really about talent uh, and winning culture in a sense. So. Um, entrepreneurship and, and the teams, you know, you're basically not able to succeed unless you kind of a have that killer team. And I think that kind of a thinking is something that we need, need for the bigger corporations as well in terms of a, when they're building their new services and new businesses, which basically they are forced to in, in the mm. new economy. All right. Unfortunately, time is running. We have only a few couple of minutes to conclude this discussion. Uh, Pekka, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned in the beginning that we need mobility. So mobility will be one good method to educate people both on private and public side to understand each other's and to understand each other's agendas. Because, because if you don't understand the agenda on the other side, it's very difficult to collaborate. And, and that kind of knowledge can be created only by, by breaking or, or, or cu cu cutting that, that line between business and government and academia as well. Um, I've been doing it in an exceptional way. I left politics and I came on, on the business side, uh, rather rocky way. But can you imagine that what should happen if, if uh, what should happen to get you to be candidate in the next uh, parliamentary elections? <laughs> Inka. Wow. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> Maybe uh, this, a is a, this is showing how how easy it is to 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 have this mobility in Finland. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't think politics is for me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Pekka, can you imagine that uh, someday you will be candidate? My, you know my, my, my wife on. wouldn't allow me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Pekka, I actually just gave up. Uh, I decided not to run at the municipal elections ever again, so actually I'm go going to the other direction. I have been in crossroads, but I think in a way, to be honest, I think you're right. At this stage of the career, it would be a very career-limiting move, maybe when I'm older. Mm. Mina. I changed the question a bit. What I can very easily imagine myself being would actually be a sustainability innovations uh, scout or director in a company or in any public sector organization. I, I, I would actually be very, you know, happy of doing it if there was any such uh, organization that, that would have uh, such a position. 
Can, can Pekka, I? now you changed your mind. Yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> New minister didn't. of innovation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mina just showed the example that you can change the question, so I changed the <laughs> So my last question would no, be, if I'm going to be next prime minister, would you accept uh, position as a minister in the government? <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, there's a, the, poli, the politics is is a special yeah, arena or special universe. But if you would have asked uh, working for government and governmental side, then I would say, which I'm doing now pro bono, that absolutely. Yeah. I agree with uh, President Ahtisari. We cannot learn that much from the US system. There are a lot of rigidities, a lot of problems. But if you look at the best academic entities in the United States, and that is my message to Aalto as well, you can do much better in creating the right kind of ecosystem of business, government and academia collaboration. Mm -hmm. And to be able to, to make people to run in and out. Because that is the way how you can increase your capacity and to become best in the world. Thank you for our panelists and thank you for the audience. <laughs>